Good evening. I'd like to thank everyone for being here tonight. I feel like everybody's so far away, I'm going to have to move the, uh, move the podium back, I think. Um, if you weren't here last week, we started last week. Mike filled in for me while I was gone. Uh, this class is the heart of the matter. And when we were going over what the theme would be for this year and we decided on is eternity in your heart, uh, it was right around that, a few minutes later, I found this, uh, this class that a guy had taught down at Emory Hills in, I think it was around 2011 time frame. And he had a great layout, and I was like, man, this would go perfect with our theme for this year. And quite frankly, it's a good topic for us to be studying uh, because it gets to the heart of the matter on everything. Um, I know on last week, Mike talked a lot about our choices and, and what goes into that and what comes out of the heart. And so, you know, we're going to, we started off with that to set the table for the rest of it, which is mainly going to be about our attitudes and our choices about everything. We're going to talk about our attitudes tonight toward God because that's where it all should start. And then from there, the next two classes will be the attitudes on our husbands and on our wives, um, which uh, I think that's a very good topic for us to always study, to figure out what exactly it is that makes us uh, make the decisions, decisions and the choices that we have about our families. Uh, our foundation should be on God first and then our family from there. And then, so those, those three things I think are very important for us to, uh, to build the foundation of this class on. Um, so we'll get started on that here in just a minute. If you would, I'd like to go ahead and open up with a word of prayer. So if you would, bow with me. Our Father in heaven, we thank you at this time for the opportunity to come together to study your word. We thank you for your, your knowledge and your patience with us. We thank you for giving us your word that we can study it and understand it and apply it to our lives. And we ask that if we do that, that we'll be a light to those around us, that you'll help us to always to look to you for the answers and guidance, and that we look at ourselves and we... We take inventory of what we do and how we think and how we judge ourselves and those around us and that we put the emphasis on your word and then we allow that to be what shines through. And ask that you go with us now and you help us to keep an open heart and open mind. We thank you for everything. We ask you to forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I started actually uh, getting this class ready, the first class ready before I realized we were going to be out of town the first time. So I had some slides that I just wanted to go over real quick that kind of goes along just a little bit of a review of what Mike talked about on uh, last week. The heart of the matter. I remember he, when I was listening to it, he brought this, uh, this verse up, Proverbs 6, and I think he focused on verse 23. It says, My son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ear to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart, for they are life to those who find them and health to, those, to one's body. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. And the reason I picked that when I was thinking about the heart of the matter, the very first part of 20 there says, pay attention. Pay attention to my words. And when I read that, I was like, what if you took that pay attention out and you put something maybe a little bit more aggressive in there, like be diligent, uh, you know, something where you, you really think about, you have to put emphasis on these words. You have to put it in your heart. You have to guard your heart. You have to be ready for this. That's what I'd read to that. Guard your heart, because that's where everything is going to come from. Go ahead and skip that one. And then this one, I don't know if you can read it back there. It's one of the, my favorite sayings, because I, I use this to myself all the time. It says, everything happens for a reason, but sometimes things happen because you're stupid and make bad decisions. How true is that? I mean, I'm, I'm talking to myself there, not to you guys. All right. We do that a lot, right? Our choices decide and dictate what we're going to do. What should we do? Should we allow, as the world says, fate, karma, Calvinistic predestination? Those are not biblical concepts. We know that. We should first ask God when we're trying to make any type of decision. That's where our heart needs to go to first. It says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. And it goes on there and it says, such a person is double-minded and unstable. If we're not making our choices based on what God tells us, if we're not going to him first, then we will be unstable in those situations. So tonight's class, our attitude towards God, what does that mean to you? You say, well, God's everything. God's great. He's, he's everything that, it, you know, he's the creator. He's all these things. 
But I had a conversation with Eric a couple weeks ago about a situation, and uh, it kind of opened my eyes to, to this same thing. And when I was preparing for this lesson, it, it was a big part of this lesson. Do we have an incomplete view of God? Does anybody in here want to admit to having an incomplete view of God? Anthony, can you have an incom incomplete view of God? Yeah. What does that mean? Well, there's a few mistakes we can make that will give us that incomplete view of God. First, I want to ask you, what is the mistake of an atheist? Does anybody know? There you go. He don't believe in God. He don't give God credit for anything. If he ever does give God credit for something, that's just accidental. It's nothing that they intentionally did. Their mistake is, com is to completely say there is no God whatsoever. So what is the mistake of a Christian? It's to have that incomplete view, right? So how does that happen? How do you have an incomplete view? Yes. to that a little bit later, kind of touching on that situation and what you're talking about there. From Jeremiah here, I, that, when I read this, it first reminded me of Ecclesiastes 9-11. And it says, this is what the Lord says, let not the wise man boast of his wisdom, or the strong man boast of his strength, or the rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts, boast about this, that he understands and he knows me. He understands and he knows me. You go to Ecclesiastes 9, and it tells you that the, uh, the race is not to the swift, the battle not to the strong, the riches are not to the intelligent, uh, nor favor to those with knowledge, nor bread to those that are wise. But time and chance happens to us all. So when we start boasting about our abilities, our riches, what we've done, who we are, what we've accomplished, that tells us, no, you have an incomplete view of God. We need to boast only in the fact that we understand him. And can we understand him if we have an incomplete view of him? What does that mean? We'll get to this in just a second. One of the things that I saw when I was talking to Eric and uh, we were discussing this and then it was again in this, this, uh, some of this material I was looking at, that incomplete view of God is because we sometimes, a lot of times, have a one-sided view of God. That one-sided view of God might be that we stress God's grace we, we, we stress God's grace to the exclusion of his intolerance for willful disobedience. That's the world's view right now. The world's view is God loves everything. Grace covers everything. Uh, you know, God loves all the sinners, and who cares if they stay, they're still living in sin? You know, he still loves them. It, it's, it's sickening to listen to some of the news channels right now when they're showing all these things. They're saying they, uh, I'm not even going to repeat what they're saying. It's, it's so blasphemous, but how they picture God and his grace and how he covers all the sins without the, the person ever repenting of those sins. You know, I'm fine in my sin. God still loves me for who I am. That's not true when it comes to this. When God tells us you're living in sin, you need to repent of it. Then we need to understand that that grace doesn't cover it. There are people out there that have that view, and that's an incomplete view of God. Now, just the same, there are those out there who say that, you know, God is a, they have a view of him as being an exacting taskmaster who is never satisfied. One who, uh, rather than having a loving and patient view of him like a father. Have you known anybody like that? Those that give up on their faith, give up on God because they, they feel like they can't ever satisfy God. He's one that gives us rules and we can only live by them and that's it. And we don't give him any, any credit for having a loving patience with us. Fear toward him. And 
once again, we're gonna get to that in just a little bit. You guys are jumping ahead of me here, but that's good. You are on the same track as what I'm going for. Uh, this picture here, I took this last week when we were out west. This is as you drive down into Sedona. If any of y'all have ever been out there, you probably recognize that where we're at there. Uh, we was coming in, uh, I don't know, that might've been Friday morning or something, and the traffic was backed up pretty bad. And I said, you know, I gotta take a picture of this. Because when I drive to work in the mornings, I, that's not what I see. I don't see that, that there. But when you look at this picture, I don't know how clear it is to you guys. What, what do you see when you look at that? What is it that sticks out to you? Mountains. 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 The beauty. I'm sorry, what? The beauty. The beauty of it? Blue skies. Blue skies. The car. The what? The car. The car. Y'all are all hitting it. You're getting, you're getting what, I'm, what I'm trying to get you to get to. Anybody else? Yeah, well, which car was you picking? <laughs> the one that's right there. It's an incomplete picture. <laughs> it's an incomplete picture if you only focus on certain parts of it. Now, are you looking at the restrictions? Some people might look at the restrictions of it. They say, well, there's a, there's a bike lane to your right. There's a curb here in the median, and there's a fence over there. So there's restrictions that keep you from going out of where you want to go, right? It's going to keep you going in one way, and that's it. That's the restrictions. There are people that may see that. That's all, you know, look at there. That's all you can do is just go straight down through there. You can't get off the road to go anywhere and see anything. Or maybe you're looking at it and you say, look at the obstacles. The car's in front of me. I can't get into town. I think whoever designed roundabouts might live in Sedona because they decided to put roundabouts after roundabouts. And, and I mean, it's, my GPS was constantly saying at the next roundabout, go here. And it was, non-stop repeating that because that's all there is is roundabouts. They've got more roundabouts in a mile than we've got in the whole city of Bowling Green. But uh, those obstacles might be what you're focusing on. Or what a lot of you guys saw was the beauty. What I take from that is this. What we choose to focus on is going to restrict our view of the total picture. What if all you're looking at is the beauty there and you totally miss the curb and curb your wheel? Or you totally miss the obstacles and you hit the car in front of you? What if you're focusing on the cars and you don't see the beauty around you? What if you're just focusing on the restrictions and you get upset? You see how that can, just focusing on one part of something can restrict the total picture? When we're trying to get a total view of God, I said that weird, didn't I? A total view of who God is, we have to look at the whole picture. We have to understand all of it. He gives us restrictions. There are obstacles that are going to be in our way, but we understand the beauty of him, too. We've got to understand all of that to get the complete view of who God is. To do that, I think we've got to look at this in three parts. One, one of the things we need to understand is that God is our creator. God is our creator. In Hebrews 11, 3, it says, By faith we understand that the universe was created by the works of God. So that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. When I read that and I think about the universe, the first thing popped in my mind was this picture. Has anybody seen this picture? That's the newest picture, I guess, that NASA has put out there from the Webb Telescope. And when I look at that, it just blows my mind how insignificant we really are in the, in the vast expanse of the space out there. And yet God still knows every hair on your head. God still knows every one of us while we was formed in the womb. And yet, that is what's out there. I think if I ever have a chance to ask God a question, it'll probably be, where's the end of that at? There's things that I don't understand. And, you know, I can understand if this room is that big as I could run over there and hit that wall. I don't understand space and God's vast. And it's just enormous amount of space that is completely unimaginable to us. At times, I think that God is just playing a joke on us. And it's really not that big. <laughs> he's, he's just saying, y'all keep looking, you're never going to find the end of it. But we see that, and we got to, there's no way that there can't be a creator, a, an intelligent creation like this, for us to have faith in. To have the complete view of God, we have to understand that. First thing that, that we have to know when we're looking at uh, our creator is to have humility. Psalms 8, 30, or 8, 3 through 4 says, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? Have any of you ever gone outside at nighttime and just looked up at 
the sky. And just giving credit to the creator. Just thinking about the, the awesome power that he has. If you want to build a bigger picture of who God is, look at that. Get to understanding that the one that created us created all of this that are, is around us. That's what we need to understand about God to start with, is have humility to understand that he is the one that has the power to create everything, but yet still cares about each one of us. Am I mistaken in <coughs> the that verse, but LR says you're right, so. Well, that's a lot of stars, I think. Yeah. And, and when we look at this, I, I don't know where we're at in that picture. You can never find us. Probably it's so small. But just to think that all of that is still out there. You know, our Creator made that. The humility that we need to have in the presence of the one that made all of that, and yet, who are we to try and dictate what he wanted, what he knows, what he thought? We can't be that way. In order for us to have a complete picture of God, we got to first have humility. Reverence. We've already hit on this one quite a bit. What about the, our reverence? What is, that, what is that about, LR? Having reverence for God. It's more than respect. You know, I respect the law, which I don't want to get in trouble. Reverence is you recognize God is holy and he sanctifies you, he, he, he marks you as a Christian, and can't hear that on the, the live feed there. LR says that it's, it's bigger than a respect. It's more than just a respect. Um, it is a fear. It's a reverence that we have for God. It is a deep respect that drives us to him and seeks to please him in every way. That reverence we got to have, it's, it's a term that it goes along with fear. And a lot of times I think people misunderstand that type of fear we are to have, that reverence we are to have for God. They think of the fear of something that we would have for some mean creature that comes up that's trying to harm us, that has nothing but malice toward us. That's not the type of fear that we see, the type of reverence that we're seeing we're supposed to have for the creator of, of this universe and the creator of us, our God. It says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. That type of respect and reverence and, and understanding we have for that the individual, the, the, the creator of all of this, is something that I don't know that we fully understand. And it's something that we should work on every day to have a full picture of God, a complete picture of God, is to have that reverence for him. Humility and reverence. And then the third thing would be submission. What does submission look like toward God? And as we read through the Bible, we read the scriptures where he talked about wives be submissive to your husbands. Christ was submissive to God all the way up to the, the dying on the cross. What does submission look like to us when we're trying to think of the full picture of God? How, how can we not have submission toward him? What if you're an individual that says you're going to dig your heels in on something and you're just not going to uh, believe that this is the way it should be done because uh, why should I? I feel like God would want me to do this. God would want me to believe that. Is that submission? said Psalms 118 when we see that submission there that you know the submission to God in all that we do submitting to everything that he does the Nazi soldiers many of them wore belt buckles that God was with us the article they wore that and the idea of God's on our side is not submission we need to be on God's side that's submission right. he says that God we need to be on God's side rather than than uh God being on our side. It's, it, like I said, it's not digging its heels in. It's not making excuses for what we believe, what we want to believe, what we're doing. Submission is submitting everything to God. Our will. Giving up our will for His. It is not 
you know, making the excuses. It is eagerly surrendering to the will of God out of respect. quote today, you just reminded me of this, I read a quote that said, uh, the devil has figured out that he's not going to keep us from believing in God. So he's decided that he's going to start perverting our view on who God is. How true is that? And how easily is that done? That's done a lot more easily than, than getting us to not believe in God whatsoever. You know, we hear all these views today where the individuals say, you know, well, we're all worshiping the same God, we're just going to do it in different ways. That's a perversion of what who God is and what his word says. And if you don't think that the devil has his hand in that, then you're not really looking at it right. The devil has said, I, I can't stop them, but I will pervert their views on it. And like you said, it's, it's, we have to study. We have to know the word. We have to dig into it and find out what it means and then submit to it in order to get the free will that we have to make the choice. God sent his son, died on the cross. We know all this. Now we have to study it and understand it to get the full picture of who God is. What about God, the source of our blessings? Do we give God enough credit for our blessings? Do you ever just thank him for the air you breathe, for all that you have, the food that you've got, and truly mean it? How many of us get up in the mornings and we, we are instantly mad that the alarm clock went off and we got to get up. I read another quote this week and it said, uh, it said, your awful job that you hate is the dream job of the unemployed guy. Your home that you don't like is the dream home of the homeless. Your aches and pains you have are the dream of the person that is on their deathbed. And it went on, it said a few other things, but just think about that. What blessings do we have, and yet we don't recognize them, we don't give God credit for them? Try this tomorrow. And I've, I've tried this myself, it works. When your alarm clock goes off, mine's gonna go off at 3.45 in the morning, and when it goes off, I'm gonna be upset about it going off and not sleeping anymore. Before I get out of the bed and let my feet touch the ground, thank God that you had what rest you had. Thank God you had the bed to lay in to give you that rest. Thank God you had the home to give you the safety to get that rest. See how your day turns out with that type of attitude. My, if my attitude to God is thank you for all the blessings that you have given me, and those blessings are everything, not just what I want to consider to be blessings, they are everything. See how your day turns out tomorrow if you do that. I hope somebody does try that and they come back and tell me it worked because it does work for me. But try, try to start your day off on the right foot. All right? And when you're having a bad time at work tomorrow or at school or whatever it is, Thank God for that trial that you're going through. Thank you for this blessing that you've given me to be able to be here, to grow stronger from what I am getting, or going through right now. You know, Eric taught a lesson not too long ago about, about Paul, I think it was, and uh, he, was, he was talking about how he was, you know, he was so joyful about the trials that he was going through. Do you do that? Are you joyful about the trials that you're going through? Have you ever thanked God? You know, thank you for putting me in this position because I'm going to grow from this. I'm going to learn from what I'm going through right now, and I'm going to help somebody else. Have you ever done that before? I think if we get a complete picture of who God is and what he can do in our lives and we give him thanks for our blessings, we'll do that. And we will be a blessing to someone else. And we can do that through, one is through gratitude, thanking him. The other one is confidence, having confidence who God is. Have you ever just felt like there's no hope in the position I'm in right now? You know, like, oh, no, what am I going to do here? This trial's come upon me now. What do I do? 
Well, I think we can learn from those uh, in the Old Testament where God gave them constant uh, blessings and they, they always said, well, what do we do now? Why did you take us out of Egypt? Why did you take us out of Egypt and bring us out here to die? They didn't have any confidence in the man that, or the, the creator who just led them through the water, who just helped them escape out of Egypt. They had no confidence in him. They didn't show it. Do we do that? Do any of you all have these, these things happen to you? Like you might have something happen and, and you're like, how do I get through this? And yet you forget that you were sick last year and you made it. You forget that you were hurt and you had to have surgery and yet he made you, let you make it through that. Have you lost your confidence in God to heal you through whatever there is? I think for us to have a complete picture of who God is, we've got to keep our confidence in him and what he can do for us. His benevolence to us should not instill, or should instill confidence in us as we face the uncertainties in the future. Anytime we face anything in the future, we should understand that we have already made it this far with his help and with his love. Have that confidence. Uh, what about God, our Redeemer? What about the God who sent his son to die on the cross for us? How about the fact that he, he loved us so much before we were ever here, 2,000 years ago, that he would send his son to die on the cross for our sins? Does that not give you peace? Does that not give you confidence? It says in Mark 12, verse 30, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And when he wrote this, you keep it in context to the people that he was writing to at the time, they had no clue at that time of the, the uh, they had no understanding about the redemptive purpose of Christ at that time. We do now. Now we have that. We have the full picture and we understand what, was, what kind of love was given there. When he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. We understand what Christ was, was doing there at the time for us. Do we have that love in us? Do we understand God's love? If not, then how can we have an understanding of who God is? He loved his son and died on the cross for our sins. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's the kind of love we'll never understand, John. I don't know any of us that would do that. You know, it's, I can't imagine doing that. That kind of love for us, that kind of love, it is something that we have to study on. Like Mike said, we have to study, we have to understand it, we have to know, we have to dig into it to figure it out, to get that complete view of who God is. If you don't understand it, and all you think is that God is that, as I said in the beginning, that exact taskmaster that says, uh, you know, this is it, and if you don't do this, then, you know, there's nothing for you. You don't understand the love of God. That's, that's, it's unimagin unimaginable that somebody would give their somebody up for somebody they don't even know. Somebody that hates them. You know, today if we have a different uh, political view than someone, would you give up your son or daughter for them? And yet we're talking about God who gave up his son for people that hated him for what he stood for and still to this day do. That's a type of love. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's un unimaginable how that is. So that's why we've got to really study it to figure out what is the true picture of God for us to understand him, to get the full view of it. So that when we're looking at it, we're not just looking at the restrictive God. We're not just looking at the, the oppressive God. And when I hear people say that, you know, the, the, the church is oppressive or the church is just uh, there to be demeaning, I don't get that. I really don't. And what I understand there is that that person has something that has restricted their view of God to the point that they have now in their mind 
have a view and image of God that is nothing more than the road that we saw with the curves and the fence on the side. They don't see the God that is, that is so beautiful and so awesome. So there's a, a dangerous side to either one of those. I mean, I, I really feel like you can have a, a real dangerous slippery slope to believe either way. One that God's grace is one that, uh, that will cover everything without, even though you're having a, uh, you're living in sin, you're not willing to obey him, that willful disobedience, and then the other side of it that, you know, God's uh, not one that is patient, loving, and, and, uh, and uh, like a father. What about peace? We're assured time and time again that having been redeemed from our sins, we have peace with God. If God is with us, or is for us, who can be against us? He did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Think about the peace that comes from the knowledge of that. If God is with us, who can be against us? I mean, that should give you plenty of peace there to understand that, look, no matter what we go through here on earth, no matter what we're being oppressed by, no matter what we're up against, God is going to be with us. He's going to be for us. And I think too many times we feel like we're out there on an island. We don't understand. Where do we turn to? We forget. We're short-sighted in that. He had that type of confidence. Do you have that confidence? Do you have that view of God that he is our redeemer? Do you have the submission to be able to say, look, I know that I need you and I've messed up and I need to repent. Once you look at the whole picture of God, once you really think about it, and I want everybody to ask themselves this week, just, just think about it. Do I truly have a complete view of who God is? Have I looked at the whole picture of it and what is my attitude toward God? Is my attitude toward him the right attitude? Is it one that looks at the whole, the whole God that we have, the whole image that we have of him? So Deuteronomy 8, Deuteronomy 8, if y'all would turn with me over there, Deuteronomy 8, verses 11 through 17. I think whenever we, we limit God, we limit his power, we limit our understanding of him, we can fall into the same snare as what uh, we saw here when the Israelites uh, were looking at their blessings, but not they weren't, they weren't really understanding their blessings. So in Deuteronomy 8, verses 11 through 17, it says, Take care, lest you forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his rules and his statutes, which I command you today, lest you have, been, have eaten and are full and have built good homes, and live in them. And when your herds are, and flocks multiply, and your silver and gold is multiplied, and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart is lifted up, and you forget the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, who led you through the great and terrifying wilderness, with its fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty ground, where there was no water, who brought you water out of the, the flinty rock, who fed you in the wilderness with the manna, with your father's that your fathers did not know, that he might humble you and test you to do you good in the end. Beware, lest you say in your heart, my power and my might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. When you read that, does that sound anything like maybe us? Does it sound like us? Has God given you everything you need? He's given you redemption. He's given you grace. And yet you say, I've obtained these things by my own hands, by my own strength, my own wealth. Can we repeat that mistake? Unfortunately, yeah, we can. And I found myself doing that at times. I don't know about you guys, I'll admit it. I found myself being, uh, you know, 
pat myself on the back. When that happens, I stop and I say, wait a minute. No, I don't, I don't want to do this. God gave me everything that I have. He's given me my health, my family, everything. The air that I breathe in, all of that we have to give God credit for. Don't make the same mistake that the Israelites did. When we fall into that trap, that's when we get into the, going back to the first verse. If we're going to boast in anything, we boast in the fact that we understand and know God. That's the only thing we can have confidence in boasting in. And if we don't understand him, we don't know him, then go back to what Mike said. We've got to study. We've got to get in and dig into it and figure out exactly who God is and what the whole Bible portrays of. How do Christians lose their sense of reverence for God? <laughs> How can we lose our, our sense of reverence for God? We don't, if you don't study and read his word, it's things like you follow false guidance. For me, it's if I don't read the Bible and listen to what you're saying or any other there, John. You're exactly right. Going back to what we started the class off with, you're exactly right. How can we lose reverence for God? If you read that backwards, instead of saying, my son, pay attention. My son, don't worry about what's going on in God's word. Just pay attention to what's going on around you in the world. That's a good way to lose reverence, right? Lose focus. Lose, lose sight of what you're going after. We lose reverence for people or anything today. If I lose reverence for somebody that ha I'm supposed to have respect for, the law, how do I do that? By just ignoring it, right? By not paying attention to what's there. That's how I can lose reverence. We don't guard our heart. Are you guys guarding your hearts? I can tell you from the past two years of being an elder, it's really opened my eyes up to how little we guard our hearts. <clears throat> How we let the world influence our hearts. How we let things around us. And most importantly, one of the biggest things we allow to tear us down is our own pride. Our own pride. When we have more pride and more reverence for ourselves than we do for God, we don't have the humility to bow down to his word and submit to him. We let pride dictate our, in, our intentions, our actions. That's a good way to lose reverence for God. Because then you get back into the race is to the swift, right? I'm fast, I'll, I'll win the race. I'm smart, I'll figure this out. I don't have to ask God, I don't have to rely upon him. Do you spend any time throughout your day praying, talking to God, asking him for guidance? I know nobody's gonna raise their hand and tell me that. I'm just asking you, talk to yourself, Whenever you get in your car by yourself, when you're thinking about it later, how much time did I talk to God today? Can you have an intimate knowledge of anybody if you don't have a conversation with them? You have to every day. Could I get to know my wife without ever having a conversation with her? Well, I think you wouldn't be married. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I'd get a good answer from you, John, if I asked that. Yeah, it wouldn't, work, it wouldn't work out too good. That relationship would be over pretty quick. The reverence for our marriage requires me to respect it, to respect the boundaries of that marriage, to talk to her, right? How is that any different than our relationship with God? If we don't talk to God, if we don't respect him and communicate with him through prayer, how can we have any reverence for him? How can we show him any respect if we don't talk to him? So, can anybody give an example when Jesus offered uh, thanks to God? Anyone? 
David went to town with somebody who knew Jesus gave thanks to God. Got his hearing. I said, can you think of a time when Jesus gave thanks to God? When, can you think of a time? Well, I mean, we know that he did. I can't, off the top of my head, I don't know the verse, but we know that he did. Feeding the 5,000. Do what? Feeding the 5,000. Feeding the 5,000. There you go. So what does that teach us? What should that teach us about our reverence and giving thanks and having gratitude in our daily life toward the one that created us? Jesus is giving thanks to the Father. I mean, how? Who is Jesus? Mike, who's Jesus? Son of God. Son of God. Yeah, but look at how much time he spent in prayer and how much effort he made for prayer. You know? I mean, I mean those lessons are, are right there for us to learn. If Jesus is spending time in prayer, how much more should we be doing? How much more should we be giving thanks? He knew that he was going to die on that cross. He's giving thanks to the one that's going to send him there. That's, that's a thought that just, I mean, that, that's a, one of those things that I guess I, you got to sit down and think about it and meditate on and understand that further. We've got a God that gives us everything every day. Are you spending time in prayer with him and giving him thanks? We can't imagine that. I've got one more thought. This is one that may require more thought and more discussion than what we'll have tonight, but Matthew 10, verse 28. Matthew 10, verse 28. I want you to think about this, and if we don't get to discuss it, think about it some more after class. How do you harmonize this verse where it says, Matthew 10, 28, and do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. All right, keep that in mind. And then you turn over to 2 Timothy 1. 2 Timothy 1 and in verse 7. It says, For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. How do you harmonize that? How do you put those two together? Supposed to have fear for the one that can that can kill the soul. And then you turn over to Matthew, or I'm sorry, 2 Timothy 1, verse 7. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but power and love and self-control. I can tell you, whenever I was going through basic training, I would every night pull out my little Gideon's Bible that I had with me, because it would fit nicely under the, the pillow. And I'd read a, a passage out of Psalms every night. And there was one in there that talked about don't fear the one that can kill the body. Who cares about that? When you're going through trials in life like basic training was for me, that was something that brought me great comfort when I thought about, I'm not going to fear this guy that's screaming at me every day. I'm not going to fear the one that is just telling me to march in a straight line. I don't care about that because there's a bigger picture. So when we read this and we see that there is a God that tells us, don't fear those that can kill the body and the soul. We get so caught up today in things that don't matter. We got the social media justice, our jury, what do you call them, warriors? There we go, I'll get it right in a minute. The social media warriors that like to get on there and post stuff all the time. Don't get caught up in that. It's not needed. Right? You're not showing reverence to God whenever you're getting on social media and making a fool of yourself. You're not showing the right respect and dignity to God whenever you get on there and you start saying things that can bring shame upon him and his church. To understand a complete picture of God is to say, that comment's not needed. I'm just going to move on. All right. Keep in, in, the important things in focus with understanding what we need to know. And in 2 Timothy 1.7, it tells us once again, for God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Have that self-control out of love and fear and respect for God. So that's just about as much time as we've got tonight. Does anybody got anything else before the bell rings?
If not, then next Wednesday night we will talk about um, our attitude toward our husbands. Not my husband, ladies, that's for you all. And our attitudes towards our wives coming up the, uh, the week after that. And those are subjects that I feel like we really need to dig into. Uh, because as I look out here and I see all the husbands and wives that are in this crowd, I can tell you I don't know that any of them are 100% perfect. And I don't mean that as a derogatory comment toward anybody. I just want to say that we all have work to do. And so digging into this is something that I think that we should do and doing it through God's word, uh, using it to be our guide. I think he's getting ready to ring the bell right now. There you go. Thank you all.